In The Happening, mass numbers of people inexplicably take their own lives. Authorities initially assume it's the work of bioterrorism, but later learn the human race is under attack by neurotoxins produced by plant life. Funny enough, trying to keep my own yard under control as two ugly old trees constantly drop moss-covered twigs and branches sometimes makes me feel like standing in front of my own lawnmower. And spoilers for the following Scooby-Doo episodes. The gang are summoned to the Arctic Circle by an acquaintance needing their help. Upon arrival, they discover he's missing, and the Inuit village he was staying at abandoned and destroyed. They soon learn the reason for both. A gigantic prehistoric creature is awake and terrorizing the tundra. Research assistant Jean-Pierre Baptiste, while working for the gang's friend, Professor Kruger, discovered an oil deposit below Inuit-occupied lands. Instead of alerting the proper authorities, he decided to drill for the oil himself and make millions. Jeepers, look at this! A submarine! Hidden beneath the Arctic ice. Another goddamned submarine. The Scooby writers greatly underestimated just how difficult it is to operate those things. Worse, this time around, they'd be dealing with harsh Arctic conditions, which would require even more effort by the crew. Baptiste and a never-seen accomplice built three oil derricks under cover of night and disguised them as 50-foot-tall totem poles, with the stolen crude pumped directly to a submarine hidden underground for transport. To further protect his scheme, Baptiste drove away the nearby Inuit by destroying their village using a giant mech suit shaped like a furry dinosaur. This disguise was chosen due to a local legend of a snow beast that guards sacred land. The bad guys using a Native American legend and a submarine to carry out their scheme. Why does that sound familiar? Both of those elements literally appeared in the previous two episodes. And speaking of repeats, the show once again ignored real world logistics by implying that two men would be enough to carry out a criminal scheme of this magnitude. Then he and a driller from the Alaskan pipeline built the derricks during the night. And began smuggling oil out beneath the ice in converted submarines. Oil drilling is a dangerous, messy, complicated process that requires over a dozen highly specialized positions be filled by trained professionals with years of experience. Only if Baptiste had worked for an oil company or came from a background of drilling would this plan have made sense. And it's clear that the writers recognize this as they added a line about a never-seen accomplice being a driller from the Alaskan pipeline. But even then, the idea of just two people being able to pull this off is ludicrous. Ludicrous! It should also be mentioned that Baptiste's field was research, not mechanical engineering. So he probably needed as much help as possible to construct a 50-foot-tall dinosaur-shaped mech suit. I'm starting to sound like a broken record at this point, but a submarine is also impossible to operate with just two men. That a submarine keeps getting shoehorned into these Scooby episodes had me wondering if either Bill Hanna or Joe Barbera served on one. But apparently neither man was ever in the military. But I'd be willing to bet somebody on the writing staff had a real obsession with them. Continuing with the repeats, I believe that Baptiste is yet another foreign operative. Though this is problematic to assert because at no point are we told where this episode actually takes place. Velma mentions the North Pole early on, but for reasons I'll get into later, the gang could not have been that far north. I am Manuk, chief of this village. Our ancient legends say the great beast comes to life when man invades the sacred lands of the north. Chief Manuk here is an obvious reference to Nanuk, the subject of a famous 1920s documentary about an Inuit man living what was thought at the time to be a typical Inuit lifestyle. The film eventually faced criticism over how much of it was staged by the producer and that what was depicted was not how those indigenous people were living at the time. It would be like making a documentary about New Englanders in the 1970s, but dressing them as 17th century Quakers. Though at least the film didn't feature any submarines. I'm assuming. 
I've never actually watched Nanook of the North. I mean, come on. It's a silent movie. Inuit can be found in locations spanning several countries in the Arctic, including the United States, Canada, Greenland, and even Russia. The fact that Chief Manuk speaks English and Professor Kruger was stationed there makes me feel Greenland and Russia can be ruled out. With the villain having such a stereotypical French name, I'd argue this episode takes place in a Canadian jurisdiction. The hostile foreign government, then, would likely be Russia, especially considering how active their naval presence is in the Arctic Ocean. And is it that unfair to assume they'd be willing to steal oil from other countries or destroy the homes of innocent villagers? I mean, just look at this asshole. Then again, Baptiste's backers didn't have to be a foreign government. Setting aside the criminal implications, a large petroleum company would have the necessary resources to build and maintain oil derricks. And though not what we see in the episode, submarines have been used to explore the ocean looking for potential drilling locations. It's entirely possible that a crooked oil company may have been secretly developing a submarine transport vessel to covertly move crude from illegal drilling locations. Keeping this operation secret would also allow the company to avoid the tedious and expensive hassle of following environmental regulations. Indeed, submarines have been proposed as a method for transporting oil in the real world, but were rejected due to concerns over the environmental hazards such vehicles would present. But let's face it, has concern for the environment ever stopped a petroleum company from acting in its own best interests? For the sake of argument, Let's assume that somehow, Baptiste and his unseen accomplice were able to build the oil derricks and totem poles, and somehow managed to get their hands on a submarine capable of transporting crude. This would still be an absurd amount of work for just two men, and the risk of getting caught would always remain sky high. Instead of trying to keep all the oil for himself, wouldn't it have made more sense for Baptiste to contact an oil company and secure a lucrative finder's fee? He could have taken a sample to one of the major petroleum producers to test, telling them he knew of a hitherto undeveloped location and for the right amount would disclose where it was. Better yet, Baptiste should have secured the services of a couple of unscrupulous lawyers to broker the deal. This would have kept his own identity hidden so as not to risk the oil company hiring investigators to follow him to see if they could find the secret oil location themselves. Granted, a finder's fee wouldn't be worth nearly as much as keeping all the oil for himself, but it would be a lot safer and still make Baptiste a very rich man. Regardless of whether he was working for himself or under the orders and with the help of a hostile nation or a huge oil concern, Baptiste gets a 4 out of 5 for his design. This was an extremely lucrative scheme, despite the constant risk of getting caught. What's not to love about mech suits and dinosaurs? And this episode had both. Unfortunately, so did previous episodes of the franchise. Snow Monsters also featured prominently several times in the past as well, so Baptiste gets no points for originality. He's also not getting any points for his cover story because, once again, it's a bad guy using a local indigenous population's legend of a giant monster. Worse, it's a white bad guy, so our old friend cultural appropriation rears its ugly head again. I was his assistant, Jean-Pierre Baptiste. I must go now before the creature comes back. Apparently, Professor Kruger never bothered teaching his assistant to close the door when leaving the Quonset hut. It's the Arctic Circle. When leaving any structure up there, you close the f***ing doors. Close the f***ing doors! I recommend for your own good that you leave at once. Hey, hey can't you tell us? Not exactly the friendly sort. Well, he is French. Do I have viewers in France? Baptiste does get high marks for the quality of his mech suit. It's well articulated, has a very convincing roar, and is extremely maneuverable. The fact that he made it a woolly dinosaur is also quite prescient, as paleontologists have only recently seemed to reach consensus that most dinosaurs weren't bald with scaly or reptilian skin, and instead likely had feathers. Like, suppose he's hungry, Fred, and thinks that we're p people burgers. That's ridiculous, Shaggy. Why is that ridiculous? It's a giant, hairy monster. It's got to eat something. Okay, we know that it's just a costume used by the villain, but the gang didn't know that yet. Or maybe Velma did. 
In fact, it's likely she already knew what was going on by that point and, as usual, didn't bother cluing in any of the others. She's just the worst, isn't she? Baptiste also somehow managed to construct the thing in the first place, despite not being a mechanical engineer. This one I'm willing to overlook, as Baptiste's background is never fully disclosed. It's conceivable he majored in robotics in college, but couldn't find work, so had to take a job with Professor Kruger. God knows plenty of us aren't in the field we wanted to be in while growing up. It's interesting that Baptiste managed to solve an issue that plagued the crew working on the giant T-Rex prop for the first Jurassic Park film. The skin of their animatronic beast was made of foam rubber, which absorbed the water used to make it rain during the electric fence scene, eventually causing the prop to shudder because the internal mechanics weren't rated for the weight it suddenly had to support. Baptiste's snow beast was covered in fur, so imagine how much water it absorbed while running through the Arctic and standing around in a blizzard. Yet it still performed flawlessly. In fact, it's a testament to the design that it managed to operate in the severe Arctic temperatures at all. Kudos to the villain, and whoever had to have helped them build the thing. I can't help but think their monster design would be worth more than all the illegal oil they would have managed to haul away. One thing viewers had to notice, though, is how inconsistent the snow beast's size was throughout the episode. When first seen holding Professor Kruger, the monster appears to be around 30 feet tall based on the height of the man it's holding. Everybody run! Hide! The next time we see the snow beast, it's several times that height, and the gang are tiny as they run away in the foreground. It maintains this size as it nearly crushes Scooby under its massive foot, where the canine is small enough to easily slip within the monster's toes. Gosh, I wonder if the snow beast is about to play the shell game. The Scooby writers really loved that joke, didn't they? Here, the snow beast is smaller again, yet still obviously larger than its first appearance in the episode. Don't move! You can't see us if we don't move. And once again, the size of the monster changes, as it's now roughly the same height as the 50-foot-tall totem poles. While chasing Shaggy and Scooby in the ice tunnels, the snow beast shrinks again to around 20 feet tall or so. Well, 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 what kept you, Mr. Beast? Uh, come down here, please, so we can check those pearly whites of yours. Scooby's dressing as a girl again. The inconsistency with the height really becomes apparent at the end when the snow beast slams against the hidden oil derricks after slipping on the ice. Here, it's just a little over half the height of the totem pole when in that earlier scene, it was shown to reach the very top. I'm not going to hold this against Baptiste because it's just another example of the poor quality control that plagued Hanna-Barbera in those days. I just wanted to bring it up because, come on, it's hilarious. Despite not being original, the Snow Beast mech suit was well designed, practical for the harsh environment, and appropriate for the location considering it was referencing the local Inuit legend. It gets high marks for special effects as it was essentially just one giant special effect, though it wasn't scary. In fact, the fur, though a good idea for the Arctic conditions, made it seem a little friendlier than if it had just been naked reptile skin. This outfit gets a 3.5 out of 5. A Scary Night with a Snow Beast Fright is another Scooby episode based on a premise with a significant critical flaw. Professor Kruger sure must want to see us badly to fly us all the way to the North Pole. Yikes! <laughs> Those are totem poles carved by the Eskimos, Scooby. The Inuit people don't live at the North Pole, and they don't carve totem poles. I won't be focusing on the North Pole mistake because the newspaper headline at least says Arctic Circle. Or rather, it says Arctic Circle. But let's just chalk that one up to a bad editor, just like how we'll chalk up Velma's usage of the words North Pole as bad geography. 
she may have been speaking generically by referring to the Arctic region by its most famous landmark, like how some people refer to the entertainment industry as Hollywood. The totem poles are harder to ignore. The reason the Inuit don't build them is the same reason why they don't also build giant stone pyramids. Lack of materials. It's somewhat difficult to find tall enough trees in the Arctic wastes. This is why totem poles are Native American art primarily found in the Pacific Northwest, where they, you know, have tall trees. In general, any wood used by traditional Inuit peoples would have been in the form of driftwood washed up from the ocean or rivers. Those would have required a shit ton of driftwood. And the biggest I've ever seen. Let's take a closer look. Yo! Indeed, the appearance of totem poles had to have raised red flags for the professor and the local Inuit population. Even setting aside the fact that totem poles don't exist in the Arctic, the fact that they would suddenly appear practically overnight would have been a cause for investigation not only by Kruger, but also Manuk. After all, his people have lived on the land for generations, so if there had been totem poles nearby, they would have been discovered long, long ago. Of course, disguising a tall oil derrick would be a major undertaking, and Baptiste could be forgiven for coming up with the only solution that could be passed off as a feasible landmark for the area. But did he have to use a tall oil derrick in the first place? Baptiste found the oil due to his discovery of black snow, which would imply that the crude was relatively near the surface, which meant the well did not have to be drilled that deeply. We're not through yet. If I can lasso that ice up there, maybe we can climb out. Terrific, Fred, you did it! Where in the hemorrhaging f did he get all that rope? If it's Shaggy and Scooby's pocket dimension, why not just pull out the bike copter again and fly out? Our only chance is to find another way out. Let's go! Zoinks! The eyes of the m m m m m monster! Relax, Shag. It's just a pair of lighted tunnels in the ice. Wait. Why didn't they already look for another way out? Why did they try climbing out with the rope first? Especially since they so quickly found a couple of obvious tunnels. Small oil drilling machinery exists. They make pump jacks small enough to fit in the back of a pickup truck. So if left on the surface, while still visible, if painted white, they wouldn't be nearly as noticeable from a distance. And that's if left on the surface. We saw the massive ice tunnels Baptiste allegedly built below the Inuit land. Instead of three massive oil derricks above ground, why not a dozen smaller pump jacks underground? Continuing on, the episode begins with another kidnapping, which is bad enough, but worse because it involved a friend of the Scooby gang. As his research assistant, Baptiste should have been aware that Professor Kruger was flying the teenagers in. So the abduction, even if necessary to protect the scheme, was ill-timed at best. Professor Kruger sure must want to see us badly to fly us all the way to the North Pole. I wonder why. I don't know. He said it was too important to tell us in his cable. Baptiste should have struck before his boss sent a message inviting Fred and the rest to the village. As his research assistant, he should have been in a good position to intercept any messages the professor sent out. In fact, as his assistant, Kruger would likely have asked Baptiste to be the one to send the cable to the gang in the first place. However, if Kruger was suspicious of Baptiste, then obviously he would have slipped away to send the message himself so as not to alert his assistant. Here's where it gets interesting. Fred mentioned that the professor sent a cable, not a telegram. The difference between the two was that a telegram was sent using wires strung on poles across the country while cablegrams were sent over undersea cables. This makes sense as Kruger would have been contacting the kids from the Arctic Circle. Baptiste had access to a submarine, so is it possible the undersea communications cable was being tapped and that's how he learned of the professor's communication? If so, that would definitely be further proof that the villain had backing from an entity with resources whether a foreign government or powerful oil company. As much as I disdain kidnapping in a Scooby scheme, sometimes it is justifiable. If Baptiste only found out after the fact that Professor Kruger suspected him of illegal activity enough to call for outside help, locking his boss up while he regrouped may have been a justifiable action. 
However, as always, it leaves the question of what to do with his victim. Drilling for oil is not a one and done operation. Depending upon the size of the well, it's reasonable to assume the operation could last anywhere from a few years to several decades. Was Baptiste planning on holding Kruger captive for that many years? Not likely. Logically, he knew something had to be done. Igloo smashed to bits! Yeah, as if some giant monster stepped on him! Is now the time for you two girls to be impersonating each other's voices? Looks like someone was fixing dinner. It's still warm. Whoever it was sure left in a hurry. Yes, because steam rising out of a pot isn't enough to determine if it's still warm. Which is why Velma had to check it with her gloved hand. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Gosh, I wonder if that's actually food in the pot Scooby is about to eat from. <laughs> The Scooby writers really loved that joke, didn't they? <gasps> he got Chief Manook! Less easy to justify, however, was when Baptiste kidnapped Chief Manook. This was the last person that he should have wanted to make disappear because Manook had accepted the Snow Beast disguise, hook, line, and sinker. Hook. Line and sinker. Baptiste should have wanted Manuk to be free to spread the tale of how the legendary monster destroyed the village, discouraging other local Inuits from investigating what happened to their neighbors. But no, Baptiste scooped up the chief, and now he had two problems to deal with. Snow beast? Huh? It smashed our igloos and drove off my people. And if you think I'm not giving Baptiste enough credit not to consider murder, not only did he try stepping on Scooby when kaiju-sized, but Manuk said the snow beast smashed the igloos and drove off his people. In that order. Baptiste had to have known the homes he demolished were likely occupied at the time, and he could have severely injured or killed anyone inside them. Incidentally, by the time this episode was produced, most Inuit villages in Canada were comprised of prefabricated wooden houses, while igloos were traditionally only used as temporary housing while hunting away from home. And that's only if the hunters didn't pack their tents. The producers of Nanook of the North weren't the only ones who didn't do their homework. Finally, looking past the flaws I've mentioned, if Baptiste assumed the totem poles would be enough to hide his oil derricks, why did he bother with the snow beast in the first place? Or if he was going to drive away the villagers, why did he bother with the totem poles? One of those by themselves should have been enough for a scheme, but both at the same time was not only overkill, but increased the chances of getting caught. If he had limited his scope to hiding the oil derricks, it's possible the village would never have known about the illegal drilling. While if he had started with the snow beast attack in the first place, the Inuit villagers would have been scared off and he could have operated without the need for the fake and entirely out of place totem poles. I'm still going to insist that Baptiste wasn't working alone and had some organization with money backing him. Even with that, though, he made quite a few mistakes, and while successful at building the oil derricks and the underground tunnels, he acted carelessly and left himself open to getting caught. He gets a 2.5 out of 5 for the operation. This leaves Jean-Pierre Baptiste and his snow beast with a final due score of 3.3 out of 5. <laughs> They really need to get Scooby fixed. Worst dog owners ever. And I would have made millions if it hadn't been for you meddling kids. That's not the officer's arm holding Baptiste's elbow. But it's not exactly far enough south for it to be something problematic. I would like to take a moment to thank my new Patreon members and apologize in advance if I mispronounce any names. Okay, I see what you're doing here. Okay, fine. I'll play your little game. But you'd better stay a paid member for more than just one month. 
I have a crush on Carl the Stuntman, my favorite. Thank you, I have a crush on Carl the Stuntman, my favorite. Thank you to everyone helping support my channel. It absolutely means the world to me. If you'd like to help, there's a link to my Patreon page below, but please only join if you're comfortable doing so. New members get a personal thank you in the next regular video I upload after they join, as well as credits at each regular video for as long as they remain a paid member. A disconnected phone call on Halloween prompts the gang to visit their friend Arlene in a New England town famous for its witch trials. 200 years after the last alleged witch was burned at the stake, the townsfolk seem ready to start the whole thing up again after Arlene is accused of being possessed by the ghost of a distant ancestor, who just happened to be the victim of that final burning. The gang's friend, Arlene Wilcox, had a secret identical twin sister who, for whatever reason, had been separated from her at birth. At some point, Arlene's sister learned of this and, instead of booking a heartfelt reunion on the Donahue show, devised a scheme to drive Arlene out of town and seize the family estate for herself. Before going any further, let's take a moment to fix something that would otherwise make discussing this episode's villain somewhat cumbersome. Their name. Arlene's twin sister is never given one. I'm going to rectify that by henceforth referring to her as Charlene. Hello, Charlene. I'm Marlene. You'll be safer here, Arlene. And whatever you do, don't open the door for anyone. That's good advice, Fred. I'm sure she'll keep it to heart. Another issue I had with this episode was determining where exactly it takes place. Early on, the mystery machine passes a sign referring to the town as Old Salem, which is actually a historical district of Winston-Salem in North Carolina. Yet everything else about the town, its history of witch trials and how the citizens dress and speak, makes it clear the location is somewhere in New England. All other signs seen in the show simply say Salem, and while the southern states have their own history of unjust persecutions, Witch trials are generally considered a northeastern concept, so I'm going to proceed under the assumption that Old Salem is meant to represent Salem, Massachusetts. The real Salem does have a pioneer village for historical reenactments, and though it's not called Old Salem, who's to say it's not called that in the Scooby Doo universe? And the sign the gang passed in the beginning was simply marking the boundary of the tourist trap. These events taking place in a reproduction of 17th century New England would explain the outfits at any rate. Charlene was aided by Gar Mooney, the caretaker of the local graveyard. The two of them conspired to make the superstitious residents of the town believe that Arlene was a witch by having Charlene dress up as the spirit of their distant ancestor, Melissa Wilcox, who had been burned at the stake for witchcraft 200 years earlier. Wait a minute. The writers gave the henchman a first and last name, but didn't think the main villain was important enough to get even one of those? Open up! She's risen from her grave on Halloween! Stop babbling, you fool! Who has risen? Melissa Wilcox, the witch of Salem! Mooney would convince the puritanical town councilman, Squire Marley, that the ghost witch of old Salem had risen from her grave to possess Arlene. Hoping the lynch mob, Marley would inevitably rile up, would frighten the girl enough to flee town and abandon her estate. This would leave Charlene as the only one left with any claim on it. Wait a minute. A Scooby villain is trying to get hold of a young female family member's real estate by making people think that she was a supernatural entity. Why does that sound familiar? This is essentially the same plot used by Uncle Leon when he tried getting his hands on the hotel owned by his niece, Lisa. Only it makes a lot less sense this time around. Setting aside convincing others that Arlene was a witch, the entire scheme hinges on a faulty premise. That Charlene would have any legal claim to the estate. Let's check out these old books, Fred. Maybe they'll help us solve the mystery. By all means, Velma, start manhandling those hundred-year-old books that aren't being stored in a climate-controlled room and are clearly deteriorating as you turn the pages. I suppose the museum should count itself lucky that those books are the only things getting ruined by the Scooby Gang. 
the Wilcox family record. And look here. When it comes down to recording Arlene's birth, it just says Gemini and everything else is blotted out. We realized you had a twin when we found the family record. Your missing sister's name had been carefully blotted out. Carefully blotted out. Carefully blotted out. Ah, uh, this is obviously some strange use of the word carefully that I wasn't previously aware of. We're never told how or why Arlene never knew about her long-lost twin. While it may seem strange that no one ever told her about her sister, there could be several feasible explanations for why their parents put Charlene up for adoption at birth. Perhaps Warren and Jane Wilcox couldn't afford to support two children. Or Charlene had medical issues that the parents were ill-equipped to handle, and it was determined it would be better for the child to become a ward of the state or raised by another family with the means to cover her medical care. Were the Wilcoxes acquainted with a couple incapable of conceiving, and when it was learned Jane was pregnant with twins, they made arrangements for one of her babies to be adopted by their childless friends. In the end, it doesn't really matter why the twins were separated, as the only important consideration is that Arlene's sister was not raised as a Wilcox child. For her twins' existence to completely blindside Arlene, Warren and Jane Wilcox had to have taken decisive steps to erase all evidence of the sister from their lives. Thus, it's a given that the unwanted sister had been adopted by a couple completely unrelated to the Wilcox family. Look at her! She's exactly like me! If Charlene had been taken in by, say, an aunt or an uncle to be raised as one of their children, Arlene would have at some point learned she had an uncanny resemblance to one of her cousins. Her surprise at seeing how much Charlene looked like her meant this could not have been the case. Being adopted outside of the family would be enough to preclude Charlene from having any legal rights to the estate. So even if Arlene had left town, the plan would immediately fall apart once Charlene began filing paperwork to take ownership of the family holdings. Even if she had a birth certificate showing her parents were the same as Arlene's, public records would immediately show she had no claim on the Wilcox inheritance. The only legal way Charlene could inherit the estate would be if she had been specifically included in her birth parents' will. This obviously didn't happen because, as the heir, Arlene would have had access to the paperwork after her parents' death and would then have learned of her long-lost twin. Yes, there could have been any number of scenarios that would still allow for Charlene to inherit the estate. For example, it's never specified that Arlene's parents were the ones who died. Perhaps Arlene's grandparents knew of Charlene's existence and were upset that she'd been given up for adoption, so they made arrangements in their will to include her anyway. They could have even disinherited Warren and Jane and only included the twins in their will, with instructions that Charlene's existence would remain secret unless something happened to Arlene. But if the grandparents were that upset that the twins were separated, would they have remained silent and not told their remaining granddaughter of the circumstances surrounding her birth? Setting aside all the supposition, there was a much easier way that Charlene could have taken over the family estate. But I'll discuss that later. A final significant legal roadblock remained for Charlene. Just because someone leaves town doesn't make their property up for grabs. For instance, if a house has a mortgage on it, the bank would eventually foreclose after enough payments were missed. As the Wilcox estate had presumably been in the family for generations, it's unlikely to have had any liens. However, if the property taxes aren't paid, then the town of Salem would eventually sell it off in a tax sale. Either way, it wouldn't just be given to Charlene, even if she could prove her paternity. Let's assume for the moment that Charlene had a legal claim to the property, there was no mortgage, and the property taxes were being kept up to date. How would it be proved that Arlene had abandoned the grounds, or was otherwise never going to return? If someone dies without a will, the courts generally award their estate to the most appropriate next of kin. This can be a long, drawn-out process that could take years to complete as it's necessary to determine the identity and location of all possible survivors. If someone can produce an older legitimate will or other documentation showing a family relationship, that's often enough to satisfy a judge. But all of this only comes into play once the property owner is determined to have died. If Arlene was presumably meant to skip town and disappear, it would take years for the courts to legally declare her deceased and only then would the process of determining an heir begin. Meanwhile, someone would have to keep paying the property taxes, otherwise the town would simply sell everything at a tax sale. Lower the ducking stool! <laughs> One more 
your chance, witch. Confess. <laughs> Again! <laughs> it's conceivable that Charlene planned for Squire Marley's lynch mob to actually kill her twin, if you consider how quickly the superstitious townsfolk immediately began to break out the dunking stool the moment they saw Scooby in a pointed hat. Was all of this scheming really worth it? Arlene's house was nice and big, but it wasn't a mansion. And we didn't see anything else that would make us think her estate was worth much more than any other upper middle class household. The fact that murder was even a consideration for such a low reward villain scheme bumps the score up slightly to a 1.5 out of 5. Well, it's another witch. That's... something. Charlene's Ghost Witch of Old Salem does at least go a bit further than the lackluster witches of Scooby-Doo past by at least including special effects. She doesn't fly, but the glowing effect is a nice addition, and there's at least one instance of her disappearing. Overall, though, the outfit is a disappointment. If you're thinking I'm being unfair, just remember that not only did the mannequin in the Salem Witch Museum have the exact same appearance as the Ghost Witch, but long before running into her, Shaggy had picked a trick-or-treat disguise seemingly at random for Scooby that also matched the general design of Charlene's outfit. Two other previous witches in the franchise had essentially the same color scheme as well. Not to mention one had the exact same head covering, except the colors were reversed between the hat and the sash. To be fair, Charlene was somewhat limited in her options, considering her plan hinged on the ghost witch looking exactly like her twin sister. So apart from a green wig, fangs, and goth makeup, anything else she might have added would have made her look less like Arlene. But would that have been such a bad idea? The scheme needed the townsfolk to believe that the ghost of Melissa Wilcox had risen from her grave to take possession of the body of her descendant. So wouldn't it have made more sense for Charlene to have used two disguises? One disguise should have been an old crone with the traditional witch attributes like wrinkles and a giant nose with warts. Charlene could have worn that one first to show Melissa Wilcox rising from the grave. She could then have altered her makeup later to look more like Arlene, which would have made it more convincing that the ghost had taken over the body of her sister. This would, of course, have required a lot more effort not only by including costume changes, but Arlene would have to have been abducted or otherwise incapacitated while Charlene was pretending to be her. While tricky to do this in the real world, hypnosis and memory-altering drugs are both a mainstay of the Scooby-Doo universe, so it would have been entirely doable. Squire Marley and his lynch mob coming across a dazed and confused girl who had no recollection of the previous hour or two would go a long way toward convincing everyone that Arlene had not been in control of herself while the ghost witch of Old Salem was terrorizing the community. I've already given more thought to Charlene's disguise than she or the writers did, so I'm going to leave it here with an outfit score of 2 out of 5. Boring and unoriginal, but at least she glowed. If you're a costumed Scooby villain and you're going to pick one night out of the year where you need to convince the citizens that a real ghost or monster is roaming the town, why in the hell would you pick Halloween to do that? You would need to pick a community so stupid that they think you were a real monster and not someone in a costume on literally the one night of the year when half the town is dressed up in monster costumes. Fortunately for Charlene, that town was Old Salem, and the torch-carrying townsfolk were apparently that stupid. This fact makes it a little more difficult to rate the villain for how well they carried out their scheme, because the bar is now automatically a lot lower than usual. Didn't she say what was wrong, Velma? She started to, but the phone line went dead. Like, remember, it's Halloween, and Scoob and I want to go trick-or-treating, right, Scoob? First, we'll help Arlene, and then you two can go trick-or-treating. Fred's got a point this time, Shaggy. Your friend sounds like they're in trouble, and you're more concerned about missing trick or treat? Worst friend ever. <laughs> Cemetery is a word that a lot of people have trouble spelling. In my family, we were taught to pronounce it cemetery in our head as a reminder that the correct spelling is with three E's and no letter A. (laughs) 
Can you imagine being a little girl in the 1970s named Lucy Leon and seeing your gravestone on Saturday morning TV? That's the kind of thing that could mess you up for life. Charlene doesn't do very much in this episode. Her first appearance is when she frightens Mooney in the graveyard, prompting him to run to Squire Marley to report the sighting. Remember, Mooney was actually Charlene's henchman, or partner. So was this even necessary? The graveyard was deserted, so surely Mooney could have simply lied to Marley about seeing the ghost witch, right? Don't call me Shirley. She next appears in front of both Marley and Mooney, convincing the former of the ghost witch's validity and prompting him to warn the village against Arlene. I say appears, but she didn't seem to have moved from her spot behind Melissa Wilcox's grave. So really, all she did was hang out for about 10 minutes until the men arrived. Charlene is then seen again, scaring Shaggy and Scooby in Arlene's house, but disappearing before anyone else could see her. This was pointless because the boys were friends of her sister and wouldn't be inclined to convince others to drive Arlene out of town. It was also a mistake because while she was inside, battery acid dripped from her disguise, burning the hallway rug and providing the gang a valuable clue. Following this, Charlene ran to the cemetery to stand at her favorite spot behind the grave, waiting until the gang got a good look at her before disappearing, leaving behind yet another clue as to how the special effects on her outfit worked. I found something. A piece of wire? And it's hot. Hmm. I found something, too. The year of death on Melissa's tombstone just went up by one year. Look at this. There's a weird symbol marked on this old Wilcox family grave. Ah, it's the mark of Mormo, a witch's sign. That symbol is actually a real one that's used in both Satanism and alchemy. In the latter, it represents brimstone, the churchy word for sulfur. After watching the gang leave, Charlene hangs out at the graveyard as her henchman, Mooney, convinces Arlene to run from the approaching mob. Gar Mooney, let me in. What's wrong? Don't open the door for anyone. Don't open the door for anyone. Don't open the door for anyone. If Arlene gets caught, she really has no one to blame but herself. Looks like Shaggy and Scooby haven't arrived yet. What are you talking about? He's right there in the mystery machine behind you. Also, Cemetery... Despite having remained in the graveyard and presumably being able to watch anyone who arrived, Charlene never noticed Fred and the rest digging an obvious trap for her. Not that it mattered, because in a moment so mind-bogglingly inept that it puts Carl the Stuntman's capture to shame, f***ing Carl the Stuntman, Charlene falls into an open grave and traps herself. The ghost witch of Old Salem had very little to do in this episode, and when she did show up, it was almost always accompanied by her screwing up. What's most pathetic about Charlene's scheme is how blatantly obvious what her plan should have been. Considering, as an identical twin, she had one option available to her that wasn't to literally the entire rest of the planet. Charlene should have murdered her twin sister and taken over her identity. That would have negated the need for the entire ghost witch from the beginning, as well as the danger involved by bringing in others to your conspiracy. Taking over Arlene's life should have been relatively easy. She was new to the area, so it's not like any of her neighbors would be likely to notice a substitution, and anyone who would obviously lived far enough away that running into them by surprise was unlikely. Granted, it's an assumption that Arlene was new to the neighborhood. It may have been her childhood home. But the fact that the closest people she could contact to help her were friends from out of town shows that either she didn't know anyone else near her or she was away long enough that any local friendships she did have must have decayed over the passage of time. Charlene could not only have taken over Arlene's life, but could have staged her own death extremely convincingly, what with having access to the body of an identical twin. Something tells me if you're shady enough to consider killing someone that close to you over a relatively minor amount of money, you probably committed actions in your life you'd rather not be held responsible for. I wouldn't be surprised to learn Charlene was a wanted criminal long before she visited Old Salem. 
If you think she wasn't capable of killing her own twin sister, just remember that Charlene's plan involved setting a lynch mob after Arlene. She wasn't above using violence to achieve her goals, whether or not it was her own hands getting dirty. In fact, as seen in the episode, the mob was actually much more dangerous than the two villains. We are here to save Salem from the witch's vengeance. Since the witch has taken the form of the Wilcox girl, we must seize her at once. You know, I'd love to say that in the nearly 50 years since this episode aired, Americans have advanced long beyond rabble-rousing speeches and blind devotion to a charismatic leader advocating violence against a persecuted minority. I'd really, really love to say that. Wait a minute. That's Gar Mooney. We find out at the end that he's a villain, but at this point, he's supposed to be Arlene's ally. We know she's watching what's going on because she later runs into Fred and the rest and tells them about Scooby and Shaggy getting caught. At this point, shouldn't she now know that Mooney is a bad guy? So you still refuse to confess to witchcraft? Like he's no witch, he's a dog. Do you mean to tell me that you could have taken your hand out of that cuff at any time? No, not at any time. Only when it was funny. <laughs> like this better work. Get ready, Velma. Again! Uh, I must save my sister witch. Oh, <gasps> glory be! Another witch! Was that the smartest thing for Daphne to have said? By saying sister witch? Wouldn't that make the townsfolk believe that they were correct in thinking Scooby was a witch? There they go! After them! Yeah, you go get that witch, Yoko Ono. Before my summary, it would be remiss of me not to mention something that bothered me with this episode. It's even less historically accurate than usual. You see, I'm a direct descendant of that poor old woman that they burned at the stake two centuries ago for witchcraft. Burned at the stake? While burning at the stake is a popular colloquial punishment for witches, they didn't actually do that here in the United States. Here, convicted witches were hanged. While we're on the subject, the last of the Salem witch trials occurred in 1693, 85 years prior to the date of death listed on Melissa Wilcox's tombstone. Or 86. And while we're on the subject, executed witches weren't usually given proper burials, so there probably shouldn't have been a tombstone in the first place. Charlene and Moody started out with a bad plan, used a poorly designed disguise that constantly dropped clues indicating it was fake, and did little more than hang out at a graveyard and incite a mob to riot. Worse, almost every time the ghost witch did make an appearance, it was either pointless or provided an opportunity for the gang to debunk the cover story. The two villains did act with a certain degree of ruthlessness, both by putting an innocent girl in danger of serious injury or death, as well as pretending to be a friend while secretly working against her. It also takes another layer of evil not only to plot against a family member, but one as close as an identical twin. Our apologies for what happened, Miss Wilcox. You waterboarded a dog and assembled a torch-carrying lynch mob. I don't think sorry is going to cut it here, Squire Marley. As for you two, you're going to jail. Jail? Oh, so there is an actual legal system at play in Old Salem, and it's not just mob justice. Good to know. Even when caught, neither villain did much. After Fred politely helped Charlene out of the grave, she just presumably stood around peacefully until Marley and the mob arrived. And even then, neither she nor Mooney were restrained. All either of them had to do was shake their arm free from the middle-aged man holding them and run. Mooney might have had a difficult time getting away, but Charlene was still in prime physical condition. I'm giving the two of them an operation score of two out of five. There just wasn't much to work with here. The ghost witch of Old Salem gets a final due score of 1.8 out of five. And that's my ranking of the villains from the second set of episodes of the third season of the Scooby-Doo Show, shown here along with the ones from my previous video. At least one of the bad guys this time managed to break into the threes, 
but sadly, the other was right down there with the previous two. Hope to see you next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. If you'd like to help support this channel, there's a link to my Patreon below, but please only join if you're comfortable doing so. Patreon members receive credit in my videos for as long as they remain a paid member, as well as a personal shout out in the next regular video produced after they join. Seeing Shaggy worried more about missing out on trick-or-treating than a friend in trouble reminds me of the time one of my friends didn't come help me when I was stranded on the side of the road after my motorcycle broke down because he was too busy playing an online video game. Worst friend 